<clears throat> okay, so we are going to do a little bit of influence grinding. So what you do is, if you have the time, you walk around to different cultures and you check out their influence quests at the start of each day and you try to get the highest influence rewards quests possible, three of them per day, which is 45 influence. So that means from my base in Zionica, I have to do this huge turnabout around the lands to go to different towns of different cultures. The much easier way is to just do three influence quests in one town where you are located and based, for, for example, Zionica. Maybe you get between 20 and 30 influence instead, and if you're lucky, one 45 influence quest. Yeah, it's a lot less, but it takes maybe 10, 15 minutes to do something like that. So much easier. So enjoy watching me walking around the map, occasionally attacking a looter army and trying to get 45 influence quests on a Sunday uh, morning with a hot cup of coffee. Take care. This group of Muslim volunteers is fighting against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. After finding mass graves of Ukrainian families, they're even more committed to the resistance. Even as they observe the holy month of Ramadan, fighting continues. At the root of their struggle is a deep desire to find a way back home to the Crimean Peninsula. Aisa is ethnically Tatar and used to live in Crimea, a peninsula in the south of Ukraine that was annexed by Russia in 2014. The Crimea Battalion is made up of primarily Muslim volunteers. Only a handful of them have previous military training. A couple of days after the war started, Aisa Kaiv released this video. It was an open call for Muslims to join him in the fight for Ukraine. In a few days, the group grew from 15 to roughly 100 members. The group has been fighting on the outskirts of Kyiv. Recently, they swept for mines and any remaining Russian fighters who might still be in the area. Well, 
там зачистку делали. Одним из первых прошли туда. Там получается женщина, муж и These mass graves are not isolated incidents. Ukraine has reported nearly 11,000 alleged crimes since the conflict began and is preparing to prosecute Russian soldiers in their custody for war crimes. Конечно, все равно, когда мирных жителей видишь, когда женщин, обычных людей просто представляешь, с ним ужасом не сталкиваются, конечно, это. Some of the battalion's fiercest fighting happened in this zoo. Ну, в целости сохранились. Общались, потому что там был пост. Когда мы через несколько дней подъехали, там прямо на этот был пост выехал танк, прямой на лодке расстрелял. Расстрелял был пост, там человек 8 сразу погиб. Заехали там несколько машин подарили, просто там в качестве людей. Ну, так вот происходило здесь вообще кошмар там. Ну, в принципе, везде по Украине, где там нет, где они везде парили. Сначала было такое чувство горечи, твердое убеждение воевать до победного конца, но потом Потому что когда я в 2014 году приехал в Киев, я так понял, что практически никто не знал, кто крики крымские татары. Tatars have faced a long history of persecution. After World War II, Stalin accused the Tatars of working with the Nazis and expelled roughly 220,000 of them from the peninsula. Deported Tatars were only able to go back in the late 80s, just before the collapse of the Soviet Union. But that all changed in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. It was a move supported by many in the region, but Aisa, who was against the Russian takeover, left the peninsula. Around the same time, pro-Russian protests expanded into a civil war in the Donbass region. Just like today, ordinary people took up arms to fight back against the Moscow-backed forces. Ну и потом уже, когда на Донбассе началось, я сразу в это дело включился. That is when he founded the Crimea Battalion. Since then, Aisa and his family settled in Kiev among tens of thousands of Tartars who were now living in exile. Aisa's family has been fighting to keep their culture alive for decades. <laughs> какие-то там ну, рассказываем друг другу истории, которые касаются нашей семьи, нашего народа. Ну, У меня 13 детей. Семеро мальчиков и шестеро детей. И есть двое внуков. Traditionally, Aisa would break his daily fast with a family iftar, but his wife and kids are now in Turkey, living as refugees. Several battalion men gather for iftar in this Muslim community center on the outskirts of Kyiv. Russia 
Ramadan is a month of fasting, prayer, and giving. Crimea Battalion volunteers deliver food to Ukrainians in areas that were recently occupied by Russian troops. The food delivery is for anyone still in the area who needs help. No matter what happens with the war, the road ahead for Aisa will not be easy, but his sights are set in one direction. Ouch! God darn it! Jesus! Okay, so let's check out the Batanian culture 45 influence quests. As far as I understand, there will always be at least one 45 influence quest per culture. And you check this board, daily quest board. Okay, there's none. So I suppose this character already done the available 45 quests already. So Batania, although sometimes it appears that if I move to another Batanian town, one of these three quests will become a 45 influence quest. Okay, so... Oh, we need to sell off some loot. Because our inventory is full of trash items. Press Alt, find the artisan. He's the trash merchant. And if I have attacked looters, he usually they usually drop items uh, that allows you to complete the, the six quests of the tra artisan. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's better than nothing. I should have to be careful here. I don't want to pick the 26 influence quests reward. Uh, because I'm hoping to do 45 influence quests. Okay, 
there we're done. Then we just sell off all these useless... I mean, hmm, maybe I could just sell everything and basically keep the few items I want to keep. That should be it, right? I want to sell all these items. A stunning, oh, 4,500, that's not too shabby. Okay. And I think we're gonna visit this. This is not very interesting, but last night, late last night, one clan declared war on my clan. Uh, it's a new clan called Possessed Bandits. It's actually only a tier two clan with one single person. And they only have one war, no alliances. So it's basically this matron malice ca girl character guy with 113 leadership that is at war with, with my clan. So I'm not complaining too much because it's a fair war. Our characters are of about the same experience and leadership level. It's basically one guy versus one guy. So for once in Bandelord Online, there there is a fair war and well he tried to attack me I, I, I kind of m watched him moving around suspiciously and positioning himself around me a couple of times doing hideouts around Zionica so I suspected he, he was going to attack me and sure enough he did he tried to well, gank is not the right word since since it was equal odds but he tried to attack me using surprise so I'm very much against the war system in Bannerlord Online. I would like there to be a cooldown before you are, declare war and are able to attack. And I will. It could be just 30 seconds or a minute. It doesn't have to be a major thing. I also would like there to be some sort of causes badly and, and a reason to attack and a cost. So basically this character just positioned himself, declared war and tried to attack me just a second later. Ambush me uh, out of the blue. And one versus one, I guess that's fine. But imagine this being done with five mega veteran super clan players doing that. What the hell kind of game feature is that? It's incredibly bad. It's just an illustration of it. Um, okay, let's see in the wood village here. What is the status of my order? There are only 875 products before the queue. So maybe I, you know, I don't know how much I, I was willing to pay when I placed this order but if you click the right button mouse button on top you see that oh so I guess I placed maybe 98 because someone is willing to pay 130 which is a very weird uh, uh, bid why why do you want to put a bid 32 gold above the second lowest player bid it's very stupid you, you know, you could remove this and just place a 99 bid and still be the first in line to get whatever work is done. Um, I mean, there's no way I'm going to chop 875 wood just to get my bid through. I'm just waiting for someone to do this for me. And then I'll... And in my opinion, 98 is pretty expensive. Uh, 50 is the lowest bid you're able to place. And it's not impossible... At least it didn't used to be impossible to get wood for between 50 and, well, let's say 95. Well, 50, 60, 70. Now sometimes you see wood price up against 200. I, I think that's some sort of gimmick from some clans to increase, you know, to, to uh, maybe to get low-level players to come to their area of the map so they can recruit them. That could be it. Because I, I, I really haven't found out why would you want to place very high bids of wood in a certain village and and announce that in in global chat like hey come to this village chop wood we have the best prices on the map for wood but i think i just at least in, uh, produced a theory regarding that that it's a way for clans in isolated areas of the map to get low level players to come to their area Interesting. It also could be that they're looking to upgrade their clan hall. But I'd imagine clans of that size, they probably have been able to 
uh, buy transport that amount of wood needed for that long a long time ago if they wanted to So anyway, we are at war. Um, which means when you're at war, you want to carry as many Patreon items as possible because they don't drop ever. Even if you lose the battle, there's a 10% chance that you lose one or I think up to three items. And if you carry very expensive non Patreon items and you lose a combat, a battle versus a player, there's a chance you lose those items. So if you carry patron items, they are permanent, they're bound to your account, they can never disappear. You can't even sell them. I guess you can drop them on the ground and discard them and destroy them, delete them if you want to. Um, I don't know. Okay, so let's check this other Batanian green culture town in the tavern. So check your influence daily influence quests. I'll, I will do a tutorial video about this in the future. Okay, there's no 45 influence quest in this cut in this town either. Not surprising. Okay, so the next town we want to visit is uh, the Vlandian town of Sargot. New culture, new chance of um, of a 45 influence quest. So what I usually do is I I listen to news and updates regarding certain certain special military operations not being political here don't want to get uh, censored okay so I, I check my news listen to YouTube while I do this drink my coffee check my email semi you know you can do this semi AFK there's a very little chance that this possessed bandits gonna turn up and do some PvP with me while I'm AF, semi-AFK, tabbing out of the game and doing other stuff. That's fine. The other thing you can lose is 10% of your income up to 20,000. So if you have more than 200,000 gold on your character, you will lose the maximum of 20,000 gold if you lose the battle. It's no major thing. It's it's annoying, of course, you don't want to lose money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a very marginal, marginal uh, sum. What you, of course, can do is <clears throat> transfer money from one character to another, so the, the character you're moving about on the map and that risk getting into fights carries almost no money at all. And if you lose the combat, you lose no money, you lose troops, but and you lose no items. So you can minimize the risk of uh, losing in PvP. It's just that the mod in its, in its current state has no good features for that. It's complicated, it's annoying, it's a time waste. I don't want to do it. So... I don't know what the reasoning is that that it's exploiting to doing it. It's it's possible. It's not forbidden. You you can do it. It's just complicated, minimizing the risk of losses in PvP. Well, the same goes for uh, PVE fights, but you're not supposed to lose those even, <laughs> even though it that happens occasionally. To be honest. Okay, so the reason, well, maybe that's not something that needs to be explained, but why I'm tr I am attacking looters, uh, my main reason for that right now is that every 20 NPC enemies you kill, you gain one influence point that I can donate to my clan. So any stack 40 or above, that gives me two influence. And I think you can do that up to a maximum of 75 influence each day. So that's a that's a 
heck of a lot of uh, enemies you can kill. I don't know if that's per account or per character that you have. But anyway, so you, you grind a little bit of influence. That's my primary concern with killing looters. The secondary is, of course, skill gain, which is will be uh, riding. And in this case, pole arms. Not that I want pole arm skill on this character for now, but whatever. I need a, I need a long pole arm in case I uh, end up in PvP. If if my clan wasn't at war, there was no risk of PvP. I would not be carrying a pole arm right now. You gain a bit of tactics, which is basically a useless skill after you get. 60 in it because there are more no more perks and as far as I know it doesn't do anything in the mod It, it probably does in um, in the vanilla in the regular game Thirdly I gain some money I gain some troop experience I gain some loot which and troops I can sell So basically the third concern of killing looters is you gain a bit of money now which enemy gives the least amount of money well looters do but you take fewer losses they're faster to kill i basically just walk through these armies it's easy for me to grind them so i don't have a lot of wounded troops <clears throat> i don't have personal health way below max so that in case i get jumped by another clan or the clan i'm at war with i'm kind of battle prepared so you might pay a small economical price grinding looters. Maybe XP gain is a bit slower. But you have that convenience, quality of life. Uh, it's, it's, it's just easier. My army is... Well, this guy has a 6,300 daily party wage army. So he has a substantial amount of tier 5 troops. But it's by far not a fully upgraded top tier elite army not at all i have i guess about half of them are troops that i'm leveling up fighting against the looters so i'm not looking for pvp i'm not looking to grind troops i'm looking to move around and do my influence quests sargot landian culture new chance of a 45 nope no 45 influence quest here uh 30 is the maximum so it jumps from between 20 and 30 up to 45 it's pretty it's a weird system you get 145 influence quest for each culture and the rest will be between 30, 20 and 30 so if you can't do 45 influence quests you want to do 30 or as close as possible oh okay um can i grab one of these i grab this 45 because it's close This is not very exciting content, I realize that. I'm basically streaming to get my hours up for Twitch. You need to stream a whole lot to fulfill certain criteria uh, they want you to do to improve your account, something, something. Now, funny thing, it's not a given, even though you have decent armor, a good shield, that you survive. If I, I My first battle today, I just rode in and I got one-shotted or two-shotted, but it happened. I died in a second on the first attack at full health. So, the horse speed increases the damage bonus for both me as the attacker but if these peasants turn around and uh, swing and hit me which they do <clears throat> i take immense amount of damage doesn't mean i will <clears throat> lose the combat because my my army is so much stronger than they are so i'm kind of protected from fully losing the battle but it <clears throat> This game is not its not easy mode because it's never. You can always go down, um, lose all your health, and then your troops just charge straight ahead. There's nothing you can do about it. 
which is not as good as fighting controlled under controlled circumstances like I am now with the ranged behind and the infantry in the front protecting the ranged. And the the parries are directional. Just because I press right mouse button and lift up my shield doesn't mean I'm going to parry anything incoming. So it's not like many RPGs that if you equip a shield, it will increase your protection no matter what. In this game, the shield is only as good as the way you're using it. Which is a in the first Mountain Blade game, I think there was no directional parries with uh, shields they would um, they would cover you if you held it up no matter how what direction if I understand it correctly but now in this version the second one you not only have to hold your shield up and time that you uh, you also have to aim it at the attack and counter it there are four attack directions up down right left and honestly, I have a bit of a trouble uh, fixing, correcting my um, directional parries, even with uh, with shields. I'm not sure that is lag or certain weapons like looters, blunt clubs, if they have a push through through shields, why that is. But Jesus. The, the NPC enemies are really good at uh, swinging through and hitting your... I uh, might as well go to Charas here and check it out for quests. I might do a th 30 influence quests down here if I find one. Yeah, it's... Um, it's hard. Okay, another four day stack. Might as well grab it. Upgrade some troops. Hmm. Excellent armor. I'm checking the global trade chats. Okay. <clears throat> the hell is in here? I don't think there's going to be an available 45 influence quest here. Because I checked Sargot, but I still get surprised sometimes that I check two different cities of the same culture, and in one of them there pops up a 45 influence quest. Maybe that's on another character. I get confused because I grind influence with more than one character, obviously. Alright. Highly exciting fight 45 44 looters versus my peasant army semi decent merchant army um when it comes to the pv and grinding in the mod i kind of wish there was more variety uh reason there are challenges like 80 stacks of bandit leaders like larger armies i could fight 60 Stacks of uh, Sea Raiders, which are very common NPC enemies. But I, there's really no reason. The cost versus benefit, as far as I am able to calculate, does not does not benefit me. So what I'm doing is slow, a bit boring, but it's safe and steady and stable and well. And I know a lot of people like to grind uh, s stacks of looters alone for weapon skill. 
But, you know, I don't see why I can't ride around poking at these guys, increasing my skills a bit while I'm grinding an army. You know, sure, if I kill these guys alone, first off, I might not be able to pull it off. I'm not that good at soloing armies. But when I have an army to distract them, kiting, I'm doing okay, as you can tell. So I don't understand that uh, method either. Nope, no 45 quest, no 30 quest. Bandit oppressors, you can only do you can only get it from the thief if you're in a group. You can do you can do the quest alone. But it's very complicated to have the circumstances right to be able to um, uh, enter into that quest. So now we go to Koyas where I have my clan hall and deliver what influence I gained today, 111. And hopefully there's a decent... I only managed to get 245 influence quest on this character. And hopefully there's a decent... Well, if I'm really lucky, there is a 45 influence quest in the Aserai culture. These brown guys, well, yellow maybe. Okay, so I wonder what's on YouTube today. I'm not going to fight these Spanish sea raiders here. Finland and its exposure to Russian gas. What it's been doing over the last few years to try to offset this potential eventuality. We'll then look at which other countries are exposed to Russian gas supplies and what's happening with regards to those countries and whether or not it's likely that we will see further countries being switched off over the next few weeks. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think the implications of this are for Europe and the global economy. So before we get into all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, and also please subscribe if you haven't done so already. I'm making a big push and trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. Hmm. So I'd really appreciate it if you're a regular viewer, but you haven't subscribed yet, if you could do so. And don't forget, I always include chapters in these videos. So if there's a section you're not particularly interested in, it's really easy to skip over it. And if you'd like to support the channel, please- Oh, this is slow. Night time forest. Oh, this is a great opportunity to go AFK if you're not at war. It's about fifty percent larger than the United Kingdom and roughly about the same size as the state of Montana in the USA. However, the population of Finland is only five point five million. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, it's situated quite far north. So the climate is very cold. Around a third of the country is actually situated within the Arctic Circle. And secondly, around two thirds of the country is covered with dense woodland. Finland is situated between Sweden and Russia and has an 800 mile long border with Russia. Finland was previously part of Sweden from the 13th century to the start of the 19th century when it became a duchy of Russia. It declared its independence in 1917. 
The biggest single natural resource that Finland has is its woodland, and that remains a major export for the country, producing lots of paper and pulp and paper-related products. Despite its close proximity to Russia, Finland remained neutral throughout the whole of the Cold War period. However, relations with Russia have always been tense. And Finland has been in the news regularly over the last couple of years as it's been considering making an application to NATO. In view of the escalation of events in Ukraine and the fact that Finland has such an extensive border with Russia, Finland has now made an official application to join NATO. And this has caused a lot of concern within Russia. During a recent telephone conversation, President Putin of Russia warned the President of Finland that he was making a mistake by abandoning Finland's neutral status and joining NATO. In an official statement, the Kremlin added that such a change in Finland's political orientation can have a negative impact on Russian-Finnish relations developed over years and in a spirit of good neighborliness and cooperation between partners. In response to President Putin, the President of Finland stated that recent moves by Russia along with the invasion of Ukraine have altered the security environment of Finland. And this situation is clearly of major concern because one of the factors that was mentioned with regards to Russia's invasion of Ukraine was Ukraine's intention to apply for NATO membership. And the primary issue here is that Russia is concerned that NATO will arm all of the countries that are on Russia's borders and therefore, in the event of any future military conflict, it will be very well positioned to be able to fight back. And if you follow the channel, you'll know that I recently posted a video on Turkey, and President Erdogan of Turkey has objected to the application that Sweden and Finland have made to join NATO. He's claiming that both countries are harboring terrorists that were involved in a coup against his leadership in 2016. And he's asked for 33 individuals to be repatriated back to Turkey, and both countries have apparently refused to do this. That hasn't been resolved yet. We'll wait and see whether or not that becomes a big issue or whether this is just a negotiating tactic by Turkey to get those people sent back to Turkey. But it does remain a stumbling block because to join NATO, you need approval from every single one of the 30 members. It has to be a unanimous vote. So Turkey does have the right of veto. And Turkey has remained neutral on the whole Russian situation. They are not imposing any sanctions against Russia. They're still trading with Russia. They're still buying oil and gas directly. And it will be interesting to see whether or not the application does get approved and if Finland does get to join NATO. As you'll be aware if you follow the channel, Russia is the major supplier of natural gas to Europe. It has installed a variety of pipelines directly to lots of different countries, including Finland. And until recently, Finland bought almost 100% of all of its gas supplies directly from Russia. On the 31st of March, President Putin, in response to the sanctions that have been brought in against Russia, announced that all future gas payments from all unfriendly countries had to be made in Russian rubles. Okay, it finally here. <coughs> Quiaz, last chance to get a nice influence quest. It had tanked in the international markets following all of the sanctions because there was absolutely no demand for rubles. None of the countries of the Western world were doing any trade nope. with Russia and therefore demand... Might as well give him equipment for 26. ...to deterioration in the value. So by making everybody pay in rubles, it increased demand for rubles and therefore would strengthen the currency. And the That's not great, the but it's better than nothing. To force all of the Western nations who are applying sanctions against his banks... It's an easy quest. Oh wait, did I just do all the quests? Yeah, that's this is within an hour, so there's not going to be any quests here, right? Nope. Okay, so we'll have to wait. Can you enter the clan hall? I'll deposit all trash loot while... That's it. So this was obviously a very bold statement yeah. from a country that was almost 100% reliant on Russian gas. And as a direct result of this refusal to pay in Russian rubles, Gazprom has now announced that it has switched off all supplies to Finland as of 4 a.m. on Saturday the 21st of May. Now, so time, that's it for now. I'm going to take a short break and I come back and I'm going to do the, some influence quests on another character a bit However, later. Finland Thanks for watching. 
you know the drill, like, subscribe, etc. Thanks for your support. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.